You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone, prank caller, prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to tune in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. Phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers. We are also, again, doing this not super live, but a little bit live on um, the YouTubes. So, um, again, this is just kind of a test run. I'm kind of getting used to doing this, recording it, and then making it a podcast and whatnot. When I get more comfortable with that, we'll actually make it live, but won't have any live calls just to kind of, again... Get used to that rhythm with people in the comment section, et cetera, et cetera, and how that goes. Then when I get comfortable with that, we'll start opening up the phone calls. But um, everybody that is on YouTube, thank you guys so much for joining in. This is, as of right now, as far as I know, the only Green Bay Packers call-in show. Um, and you don't have to be a Packers fan to call in, by the way. Feel free to call in. Let me know what you think about whatever it is you think. Uh, I would encourage you, if you are not a Packers fan, to call in and talk some trash. I've been begging people to do that for a long time. Nobody seems to want to do it. I suppose it makes sense. You don't want to call in to a show and then, um, you know, maybe if it was a little back and forth, but it's kind of unfair when I get the the last word. But I would encourage you to do it anyways, and I'll try to be nice about it. But anyways, um with that being said i think we're ready to rock and roll let's uh start with nico okay i had to call back always uh, freaks me so out with that beat you just made a comment to jimmy about how our team would give up with rogers and it's true now he did he early in his career you know prior to 16 dude could come back never worried about being down because they're gonna be able to get it but i know some of us old folks Remember the Favre days. And yeah, a lot of us are comparing, you know, Clifford to Favre. It's not really always a good thing because he's just running around just gunslinging it and, you know, throwing interceptions and running first downs and throwing dimes. That's kind of what Favre did. Back in the Favre days, and I know you watched him, but you were younger. That's the more throw. I, I don't know if you remember the Seattle game, playoff game. We got down 14 nothing, And I didn't care because I'm like, oh, we're going to win. We would definitely win. And we did, you know, because like back then, during the during farm time. Say what you want about it. now, back then, that's why he still is one of my favorites, man. It didn't matter if he threw five interceptions. You do. That, that one was going to yank right. some laser in between two fingernails of defenders, and, you know, Donald Driver would catch it, or Greg Jennings would catch it. And back then, nobody gave up. We'd be down by two touchdowns in the beginning of the fourth quarter. I'd be like, I don't care. We got, we got this. Um, and uh, you're right. The Rodgers team was kind of soft. Right. And I think that was because of his aloofness and his, his, his weirdness, his hippiness. You know, he wasn't just one of the dudes, you know? And I think Jordan's going to be one of the dudes. Um, so, yeah, back in the 90s, uh, you know, prior to Rodgers, it didn't matter what happened. We knew we were going to win. And Rodgers did kind of, like that, the last four or five years, I didn't like the attitude. So, I... So we definitely need a new attitude. Us old folks remember, you know, the Brett Favre years when it didn't matter. That fool threw three interceptions in the first quarter. We didn't care because he was going to throw five in the second half. So I don't know, man. Uh, uh, we, we need a, we need a new attitude as fans, even. And and if the if the team has a new attitude, that's freaking great. And if they they do, it's because it comes down from the top. And the top is Jordan Love. Rogers is just a weirdo. I think they couldn't connect with people. Connected to a few people, but he even said to himself, I ain't gonna go out with them rookies. Really? The rookies are your, your lifeblood. What a dork. So, uh, I, I, and the fact that they're all young, it's gonna be a world of a difference. So I, I'm just singing the same song as I did a minute ago. I think you get it. So, uh, yeah, uh, whatever I just said, go back to Dork only gets funnier when you realize what it is. Um, yeah, man, I mean, that did, and, and, and I don't want to, pretend that Aaron Rodgers never led some great comebacks, right? We've, we've seen that, not just him, but the team and whatnot. He, there were some magical things, but you can't tell me you're a Packers fan and didn't just feel the team give up all the time. Like, that happened all the time. You could just feel, especially early on, if things weren't going right, and, and, and it was a team that really wrapped itself around Rodgers. 
And if Rodgers wasn't feeling it, and if Rodgers started, you know, if it just wasn't going real well, like again, or, or th- th- this is what I've, anytime somebody brings me on their podcast, you know, rival team, what do we have to do to stop this guy? He's unstoppable. Well, the answer is you win up front. If you stop the run, you force him to be one dimensional and you can get some pass rush or whatever, you just, just be disruptive. Because there, there is no plan B. There's, there's no winning with defense. There's no changing this or that. If Rodgers starts getting flustered, if he starts not being able to do what he wants to do, it's over. And it's not just Aaron Rodgers. It's, it's everybody. Because when he's not able to do it and he starts to, his demeanor goes south, everybody's demeanor goes south. Suddenly our defense is terrible. Our, offense, our receivers are dropping passes. And it's just like, what, what, what is happening here? You can just feel it. And like I've said before, 2018 was the worst I've ever experienced that. You knew in the first drive if you were going to win the game. Usually the answer was no. They'd go three and out. They'd all be pouting on the sidelines like, well, I guess we're done. Because there was no coming back. Um, and yeah, I, I, you're right. I don't super remember, although I don't really hardly remember any anything that happened even last year. But um, I, I do know... That, that I don't remember that feeling, that feeling of like, well, we're definitely not going to win this game because things are not going well. You always felt like you had a chance. And, and again, that was the case with Rodgers for a long time, but especially, I guess, the last few years, maybe going back to, I don't know. I, I, it's kind of weird because it was kind of this in-between period, right? Through 2014, everything was great. 2015 was a weird year. Like something was off with Rodgers. Then 2016 was good. Then 17, he gets hurt. 18 was a disaster. And then you've got the the Lafleur era, which was both great and horrible at the same time somehow and very weird. And, and we none of us really saw things the same way. But um, in that period, let's whether you want to say from 2015 or 2017 or 18 or whatever, it just felt like something changed. And um, there wasn't that sense of... Um, you always have a chance with Rodgers and all that stuff that people always said that people continued to say all the way through 2022, but really just wasn't the case anymore. Um, that that did kind of go away a little bit. There, there wasn't that sort of climbing back thing. You were either the, the Packers were either the better team and they won or they weren't and they lost. You didn't really see this like this heroic comeback and this this, you know, we're, we're down, but we're fighting back. It just it didn't happen. Um they dominated the second quarter for whatever reason. They were usually terrible in the fourth quarter, and I don't know. It just was what it was. It worked as 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 well as it could for what it was, and you know we got those thirteen wins three years in a row. But um, that's about it. And we'll we'll see what this team has. You know, um, things do seem positive, but much like Aaron Rodgers with the Jets right now, it is sort of the honeymoon phase. You know, we haven't seen what happens when Jordan Love starts losing games and how the the team reacts. I mean, he might lose the locker room. These guys might start to just not believe in him anymore, or same with the coach, or, or whatever the the case may be. You know, in in New York with the Jets, oh, Aaron Rodgers is the greatest human being on earth. He's the greatest thing. He's so nice, and he hangs out with everybody. And I don't know what everybody in Green Bay is complaining about. It would just wait, okay? Wait until he takes a couple sacks, turns around, starts screaming at your offensive line, and you know he turns over to the the head coach and flips him off for calling a stupid call or whatever else it's going to start to deteriorate pretty quickly. All right, let's get through the honeymoon phase before we start uh, officially declaring anything. But it does seem positive for the Green Bay Packers so far. I don't know what that means for resilience, but it, it is encouraging so far. There doesn't seem to be that feel of, I mean, things things that's been kind of the mark of this whole team so far is they start bad. From Anders Carlson to Sean Clifford, you know, he, he threw the two picks, comes back and and goes on a touchdown scoring drive you know J- jordan love his first series he misses musgrave horribly and doesn't end in points and he comes back the next time and he scores a touchdown that in and of itself can be a great thing we actually have four quarters and you can mess up for a period of time and and it doesn't negatively affect things so horribly that you can't come back and win i mean that that in and of itself could be a win to actually have four quarters to try to win a game as opposed to either you dominate in the first quarter or you lose so i don't know I don't know. We'll we'll see. I, again, I don't want to make too big of sweeping comments on how things are with uh, Jordan compared to Rodgers. We'll have to wait and see how these things flesh themselves out in an actual real season. 
Brian, it's your your uh, second or first first biggest fan here, serial entrepreneur. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, I'll tell you all about my my entrepreneurial history here. All right, great. And probably next one or two. I have something I gotta get off my my chest. Oh, and I gotta give you some some advice. Hopefully, oh. hopefully you like it. We'll we'll see what you think. But yeah. something I gotta get off my chest. And if you haven't watched Hard Knocks yet with with Aaron Rodgers, highly recommend you watch that. I was I was all excited to do it until I realized it was on HBO and I I pay for seventy five different things and HBO is not one of them and I can't justify paying for HBO just for Hard Knocks. Maybe they have like a free trial or something that I could just cancel, but I won't end up canceling it and then I'll end up paying for it. So I'm probably just not going to watch it, but I would like to watch it. It seems like it'd be entertaining, but I don't think I'm going to end up watching it. And then go ahead and listen to the Athletic Show with uh, it came out last Friday with Randy Mueller, the GM, the GM Athletic section they, they come on every thursday or friday or something like that but he he uh, randy mueller the he won a few awards for for gina ammon i think that's a word <laughs> okay. uh for uh he gives his thoughts nope. on it it's just brilliant very very insightful and then go ahead and watch uh johnny menzel uh untold story on netflix so mm. ooh, good some good good uh i'm iffy on that one i don't know if, i don't i don't know it kind of seems like it might be interesting, but it's just it's just a time investment that I don't feel like paying for a story that's how old now? Like, it's such an old story. I don't know that I care. Football for you. Anyways, uh, there's episode one, Hard Knocks. Mr. Robert Sala gives a speech about the Jets, his Jets, and mm-hmm. how they're, he starts talking about some Eagles. And he goes, there's only one bird that can take on an Eagle, and that's the Crows. And they're only brave. They're the only ones brave enough to like to attack it. And what they do is they attack its neck, and the eagle flies high, 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 high. And he's like talking about it. So I'm like, okay, so are you the eagle in this story, or are you the crow? And he talks about how the eagle flies up high, 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 high. And then apparently this lack of oxygen, and the the eagles need enough to survive, but the crows don't. So the crows die. And they fall off. I'm like, okay, you're the eagle in this story. I'm like. First up, you're not. I mean, I was just so lost in his story and his analogy. I'm like, you need to, Robert Saul, you need to get hooked up with and tighten that up with Ryan Schlipp. And because he's the king of analogies, let oh, me tell you me. about him. Because it was just awful. It was just all over the place. I'm like, okay, so you're, you're no, never been number one, Robert Saul. Like, you're never been compared to an eagle. First up, you're the Jets. There's literally a team out there called the Eagles. And you're calling yourself an eagle, like yeah. I'm sure there was a point, but I'm I'm sitting here as you're talking, like so. Wait, what what happened? I don't understand what the point of the story was. Like we're gonna we're gonna rise so high that everyone's gonna suffocate and die, and then we're gonna win a Super Bowl or what? I don't I don't know. I don't I don't. Okay. Just so lost, so awful. Being yeah. in the entrepreneur game and the the fitness world, I've been like had all know a lot of speeches I've, I've heard a lot of these motivational talks and like that's absolutely the worst <laughs> and you're supposed to be a professional with this i'm like oh it's just it's just bad and then uh uh the this guy named Lee shraver shows up in a helicopter he's apparently the voice of god and i'm watching this i'm like who is this guy and he shows up i'm an like actor. he looks kind of familiar and then they have to like i had to go and imdb it who this guy is and it was just like Aaron Rodgers just got a huge crush on this guy. Like, mm-hmm. oh, this guy's so awesome. He's so and like, there's a nobody. Like, what is going on here? It's just, just like really, I don't know. I predict. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll give you. So just so you know, there is a three minute maximum. People get cut off all the time. Just for those that don't know, Eric did call back in and and fill in. But yeah, so I I didn't know. I don't know how you even pronounce his name. Leave Schreiber Schreiber. I don't know. But anyways, I. I know his face and I know the name. And then I heard Aaron Rodgers comments about he wants to meet him or whatever, because he's the voice of, of voice of God. Or I, I, I just know him as an actor. I had no idea he did the voice for hard knocks. I didn't even think he had that special of a voice, I guess. I don't know, but I recognize him as an actor. Uh, I, but yeah, I never, he's, what would you call him? Like a B list C list actor. I don't know. I don't think he's a real big, thing I, I guess he's more known for his voice but i i never even know he did voice acting to be honest sorry i got a little rambly there i got good. a little, little fired up in that last as i ran over the the, the other thing about the show this is hard knocks now is the uh th- they have a preseason game and they were like worried about zach wilson's sleeves like cutting off 
articulation on his arms to show his like bicep beans and they're talking about, yeah, your arms look good, Nick, and all that, and they're on the sidelines. Then, like, Robert Sala's there, it's like first quarter, and he's like walking, and he's like, oh, I'm so bored. Oh, is this the, this is the longest first quarter in NFL history? He's like complaining to the ref, and ref's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then, and then um, apparently Aaron Rodgers was calling a couple of the plays, maybe one or two of the plays on the sideline, like the long bomb. Like, the, it's just like, uh, it's just like, you guys are not doing very good here. Like, this is not how you run a professional team. You know, I, that's not one to talk, but it's like, uh, I don't think this is how you should be doing it. Like, yeah, I'm so bored. Uh, is this game over yet? Uh, like, it's not a good look, Robert Sala. Right. You know, you're, you're trying to impress the world here. Oh, and they're they're acting like they've already won. Like, uh, he's Robert Sala's like getting shaked, handshaked with other people, and they're telling, him, "Oh yeah, congratulations, congratulations." And Russell's like, "Thanks, thanks." Like, you, you haven't done anything yet. You've lost. You haven't had a winning record in any. At all. And you, you're acting like you've won everything. Sean Payton was so right. And he's like, he's like, they're, they're acting like they won the season. Yeah, you know, they're, they're the Jets. They're acting like they're, they're the best already. Um, kings of the off season, if you will. The, uh, what was the other thing to tell you? I think, think that, think that's it. The, uh, covered it. So, so, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts if you've ever watched Hard Knocks yet episode one. I'd like to hear your, gather your thoughts. If you're not good, then go ahead and watch it. If you don't have HBO Max subscription, uh, just let me know, and I will give you money to go ahead and get the subscription, so that way you can watch it, so we can talk about it. Okay, let's watch it later. Bye. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, again, I haven't seen it, so I don't know, but based on what you're describing, that does sound like a disaster. And yes, I I um kind of assumed I was the only one that agreed with Sean Payton. I uh, not that I know, but I didn't think he necessarily said anything wrong. Um. I know a lot of people like to say, oh, he's just covering his tracks. No, he's he's not. He's very obviously not trying to cover his tracks because he came out and said that he would, I don't remember the exact thing, but he, he said that things were going to be better. So that's not covering your tracks because things are about to be bad because then you just shot yourself in the foot by saying that he's going to fix everything. Um, but yeah, no, it, it just, it does sound like a disaster. And at the end of the day, the reason teams stay at the bottom is for a reason. There are organizational issues. Um, and so, yeah, maybe Robert Sala is going to be a head, good head coach. I have no idea. He has not proven that. He is seen as one of the better head coaches in football, despite having never proved that ever. Um, they have an offensive coordinator who was a complete and utter disaster of a head coach in Denver. I mean, that was a complete I mean, that's where Sean Payton was indisputably. I mean, everyone's, oh, that was the worst thing you could buy. Dude got fired mid-season. You can talk about, well, there's a code. Fine, there's a code. Maybe he shouldn't have said the words, but the words he said were correct. 100% correct. That was the biggest disaster in the world. And honestly, where has where Hackett had success? Where has he been successful? Are you saying Green Bay? Where? How? Doing what? Matt LaFleur is the play caller. He's the offensive guy. So, yeah, okay, so you've got Hackett over there who basically is is just a person that everybody likes. And if you listen to all the compliments about Hackett after the Sean Payton comments, I didn't hear anyone compliment him as a coach. It was always just he's a great human being. He's, he's one of my best friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just it, it's just kind of a disaster. And they, they have an owner that butts in and does things he shouldn't have done. The offensive line sounds like a disaster. I mean, Mekhi Becton, it sounds like the coaches showed up and they wanted him off the team because he was so bad. And the ownership is like, you're out of your mind. We just invested a ton into him. He's going to play. He's going to start. So I don't know, man. Maybe they'll be great. We'll see how it goes. But, um, I mean, we have seen examples, as Sean Payton said, of teams, quote-unquote, winning the offseason, and it doesn't turn into anything. I, I, I remember the dream team with the Philadelphia Eagles. And it was just the most masterful thing. I remember a guy bringing out a whiteboard and he's talking about the cap genius. Like, how is he able to get all these, these superstars on here with, uh, how did he maneuver the money? Like, this is the most amazing thing ever. That team sucked. Like that team was so bad. Um, but who knows, maybe it'll be like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They went out and got a bunch of people and, um, and won a Super Bowl. But yeah, we'll see, I guess. Trevor, what's up? Hey, Ryan. Uh, 
Trevor in Virginia. I got two things. Um, one, I think it's hilarious the way you're talking to, you talked about it a couple days ago. Um, Pat McAfee talking about how like the media is like out for Jordan's head and like, I, I care exactly what he said. It wasn't that, but it was like, you know, that, oh, how, they're going to be done without Rogers. And it's like, you led this charge. Like you wanted Rogers on your show every week, which he's, he's about the ratings, the money, you know, so like, whatever, like he's, he's doing it and it's working for him. So, you know, go, go get yours. But, um, and now he's like, he's starting to, you know, he's like recognizing that love could potentially be a good quarterback. And it's like, you would have never said any of this if Rogers was still coming on your podcast weekly. Like, it's just, it's funny the way he's like, I feel like the media did it when he was like the lead guy of that. Yeah. Um, and then, the second thing um, that I'm forgetting is, oh, um, been a lot of talk about, you know, Love might be like, so far he's like slow to start and then, um, you know, gets hotter as the game goes. And I honestly think I would take that over what I see Rogers as, which Rogers was the one to start fast and in the snow, which always led to nail biters, us trying to hang on to the win. Um, and you know, uh, of course he had some moments at the end of the game, every quarterback going to, but I think as a whole, Rogers was the guy that start fast and in slow. And if we didn't start fast, like I pretty much knew that was it most right. of the time for the game. Like right. if we exactly. didn't have that fast start. We weren't the team with Rogers ever that was going to come back late. I mean, it just, it was not, it was not that we did. So, you know, I think unit love is a slow starter. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, he works through that. And if it's just that way in the beginning, even. So I just think it puts you in a better position at the, you know, to win more games because when you want to be playing your best is at the end of the game. And I, I don't feel like we were ever that team with Rodgers, you know. But the, the greatness we remember is coming out and either burying teams early or early lead and hanging on. Like, so anyway, my thoughts. Go Pat, go. Right, but that, I mean – that ultimately assumes Jordan Love is going to come out, have one bad series, and then be great for the other fifteen or however many times they're going to take the you know the the, the other three quarters plus ninety percent of the first quarter. <laughs> you know, uh, we've only seen him do like one or two series at a time. So, yeah, I mean, of course, everybody would take that if if you're going to be only struggle real early and then you're fine for for you know the, the next three and a half quarters but i don't i don't think that that's a realistic expectation like that's not a thing that generally happens to anybody if he's struggling with his accuracy that's going to show up in the second quarter third quarter fourth quarter that's going to cost you games at times so um yes in, in just on its face i would take that too struggle real early and then immediately fix it, and then you're good to go for the rest of the game. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. But that's only because we see him for just tiny little blips of time. So we'll have to see, uh, probably, I guess, week one, how this materializes. But again, I, I don't think this is going to be that. I, I, that's that's kind of what it sounds like in terms of how things are going, but I don't think that translates to, again, one bad series, and then he's fine. I, I think accuracy issues are accuracy issues. Um. In fact, on tomorrow's podcast, I went through because I wanted to to put some teeth to what I've been saying about the issues that have been happening because I'm getting responses saying, well, it's just one game. It's just one throw. No, it's not. I went through and read every single one of them on tomorrow's podcast so you can hear it. But there are I will kind of um, a little bit of a spoiler alert. There are 21 notes that I have on Jordan Love that are overthrows, underthrows, through too wide. And that doesn't include just notes that said bad pass or, or I, it, uh, incomplete. I didn't put it in there. Interception. I didn't put it in there. Near interception. None of that. It's just if, if you got a guy wide open and you overthrew him, it went in the notes. We have had, I think, 11 training camp series uh, camps so far and 21 of these notes. So we're talking like two per training camp. So... I don't know. I it, it it is a concern for me. Clearly, I'm not in the majority here among Packer fans, where everything is going to be fine. But I, I, I all I can do is operate with the information I have. I have lots of information saying 
this is an issue. I have zero information saying that this is going to be fine. That doesn't mean it can't be fine. I'm just saying I'm going to trust in the information that I have. And as of right now, the information I have says there are accuracy issues and there are major deep passing issues. There are also major issues under pressure with Jordan Love. Those are three major issues we've seen, and I've had nothing really to give me any confidence that these issues are solved, are getting better, are anything. So until I start to actually see it, I'm not going to assume that it's going to happen. I'm not assuming it won't, but I'm, again, not just going to assume everything's going to be fine. Oh, I forgot one thing. I don't know how I called and didn't mention this. I mean, that preseason game, that dime in the end zone to Romeo Dobbs, that was magnificent. I'm sure we've already talked about it, but let's all just remember it again. Um, I mean, you know, it's one play, right? I get that. But just like something to get some excitement going. I just picture that happening week one against the Bears. And the Bears fans just sinking in their seats as they realize all their dreams of this terrible Packer team are not coming true. Um, cause even though there's a, you know, there's probably going to be bad moments. There's there, there could be more bad moments than good moments even, but I mean, the, the ability is there and the, the, the talent that love has, you know, if, if it all comes together, right. It's just, it's exciting to think about. So I just, I didn't watch the game, you know, just saw like some highlights and stuff, but that pass was phenomenal and got me real excited. So go back, go. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a, uh, you know, I'm I'm not gonna, if this is like the Olympics or whatever, I'm not gonna throw up a ten on that pass. It was it was a good throw, but um, you know, I think the 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 biggest thing for me that got me excited is what I what I had asked for prior to that game was just an efficient drive down the field for a score, and that's what I got, and that's all I'm asking for. Matt Lafleur needs to get these guys open. The, the weapons that we have need to be weapons. They, they need to be fast. They need to be agile. They need to get open. They need to run the right routes. They need to catch the passes that are thrown to them. They need to be able to generate some level of yak if it's available. And uh, Jordan just needs to be efficient. And that's what he was. So, you know, at the end of the day, if that's what our offense can do, then our offense is going to be just fine. It does suck that we're not getting lots of data as far as, you know, we're not even seeing a quarter, a half, a game, nothing. but in the limited amount of time, that's really all I'm asking for. So even, you know, people are kind of dunking on Jordan because it was sort of dink and dunk throws. I don't really care so much about that. That that doesn't bother me as much, aside from the fact of I need to see the other thing just to know that it's there. But like, like you said, with week one, Bears fans are not going to be jumping up and down if we dink and dunk down the field and get a touchdown. That's not cause for celebration. How we got down there is not going to matter. So... You know, again, just the offense as a whole being efficient and being able to move the ball down the field is ultimately what matters. But there does need to be those other things, and those are the three things that I'm looking for is the just missing the layup throws. Deep passing is a big issue statistically, and uh, pressure is a big issue statistically for Jordan Love. And in the little bit of, of, of a little bit that we've seen, it's been a big issue. Um, so those are the things that I'm mostly concerned about right now, because if, if, you know, we can't just trust that there's never going to be any pressure and guys are always going to be open short and we can win without any of those explosive plays, that's, that's just not going to happen. I mean, you're going to have to be able to generate those at some point. So baby steps, efficient offense, get the score. Great. Now let's, let's see what we can do under pressure. Let's see what we can do with some of the more explosive plays. Um, you know, let's, let's build on this, but so far, not a bad start. Hey, Ryan, it's Craig. Hey, Craig. I appreciated your comments about uh, the kicker concerns after the first uh, preseason game and what's been going on in camp. And uh, I agree with you completely. It seems like kicking would be the one position in the pros that's pretty similar to what it is in college, unlike almost every other position where it's faster and more complicated and you're playing with a a much, you know, against higher quality people all the time. The kicker is, seems to be pretty independent of that. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, And when we hear LaFleur saying, well, you know, he'll learn from it. He'll, he'll correct. We're working on things. 
I got to believe there's a kicker out there that has that stuff <laughs> that doesn't need a major correcting or changes in how they kick because they were successful. So whether it's a veteran or some other college kicker, I just, I'm, I'm shocked that, that we at least don't have someone else in camp that's, uh, that's taking some kicks because I agree with you. It can ultimately cost us a game or two, if not more. Um, and that's, uh, would be a demoralizing way to lose similar to what we had with, uh, the terrible special teams a few years ago. So anyway, hopefully they, um, they, uh, reconsider and, and at least give them some competition. Take care. Thanks for all the good work. Bye. Yeah. And again, I, I just, I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I don't even know necessarily that I disagree with it. I mean, they're just kind of backed into a tough corner right now in terms of, you know, what, what is the best thing to do? You can't cut bait on them. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. You draft, I mean, it's, it's a big investment. Um, but, but I also feel as though I, I feel very confident we are going to lose games because of this. So I, again, I think what's going to happen and maybe it's the right thing. Maybe it's not, I don't know, but what's going to happen is we're just going to have to grit our teeth and deal with it and just, hope for improvement and if it doesn't happen then you know next year we can start looking at a different direction and i don't even know exactly what that is but um i i don't think there's going to be e even necessarily competition because i think they want to give him as many opportunities to kick you know every time there's an opportunity to kick they want him kicking and so i i just think this is what it is you know um it's frustrating it's annoying and um you know maybe it was a bad decision Again, Rich Bisaccia really wanted him. He knew him since he was a kid. He was determined to fix it, and maybe he can. There's a lot of Packer fans that are, you know, hey, if his brother got fixed, so we know Anders can get fixed, which isn't true. But um, well, I, we'll, we'll see. Again, I, th there's nothing else to say about it. That, that just It just is what it is. I don't think anybody else is coming. This is our kicker for 2023. And, um, you know, unless things are so unbelievably bad, they're ready to completely cut bait on him, um, which is possible, by the way, if things go that south. It's not going to happen in the preseason. It's going to happen in the regular season. You know, maybe like two games in a row we lost because of him, extra points getting missed, stuff like that. That's when it's like, all right, he's officially cut. Like we're because, I mean, again, that's a big deal. I mean, wh when do the Packers ever cut draft picks in the first year? That doesn't happen ever. And and most of these guys are are expected to be backups. You know, you draft somebody in the fourth round, fifth round, or whatever, they're not going to be. You know, when we got Kingsley and Igbare, there was never any expectation this guy's going to be Rashawn Gary. Ever. It was just he's going to be a solid second string edge rusher. Maybe by some Packer fans, fine, but realistically, no. But this is this is a this is a draft pick that is expected to be the starting kicker for the next 15 years, period. So cutting bait on that is, is a major, major thing. And again, I just don't think it's going to happen. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you want to support the show, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Um, please check out grassfedcooperative.com. Use promo code Packer10 to get 10% off your big old box of meat shipped directly to your house. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Ryan, Kyle from Madison. Hope you're doing well. Doing good. Hey, a couple things. First, a question. So when PFF does their grades, uh, how, how do they grade? Is it a results-oriented grade? Like, is it a per-snap assignment of a grade, and yes. then you take the average of those grades? It's not an average, no. Um, or how does that work? I'm just curious. Like, if a guy, are they, like, breaking down the technique used? So, like, if a guy uses horrible technique but then gets a sack, they get a really good grade on that play or how maybe you don't know, but I was just curious if it's, if it's just a results, like if you, if you make a good play, no matter what kind of trash happened before you get a good grade on the play or, or how that works. Uh, just curious if you know, uh, second thing. That granular, I don't know. I do know that it's play by play. I know that it is a, a two point grading system. Uh, in half point increments in terms of positive two, negative two. So 0.5, one, 1.5, two, and that also works in the negative. 
I know that they have a 300 page manual that their graders need to use in terms of what it is. And if you look at their quarterback, um, if this wasn't live, I'd pull it up, but they've got a, a quarterback thing. What the heck is it called? Every year they, they have a, a breakdown of, of major statistics for um, just the quarterbacks. And, and it really shows how granular they get, right? It shows like, for example, where a pass was, that was, you know, it, depending on the direction of the receiver, where was it? Was it, you know, here? Was it here? Was it here? Was it here? Here? You know, th- there's, it's like a bullseye. There's a range and where that ball ended up determines how good of a throw that was. And then you're probably going to have to add in whether that was under pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly in terms of, you know, well, let me put it this way. Justin Fields got a 60 PFF grade despite his unbelievable stats. So in terms of it's not just results like, well, he threw a screen and it ended up. No, no, no. The the result of what you did as a passer is what they're grading. So your ability to throw a screen pass, after that, it doesn't matter. So the touchdown had nothing to do with Justin Fields. That's not what they're grading. In terms of like, you know, if he has bad footwork and then still delivers a touchdown, are they going to dock him for that? I would doubt it. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. 100% exactly how that works, but that is essentially what it is. And, and I don't, I haven't heard you say this, but uh, a lot of our oppo- opposing fan bases have been saying this lately. I'm getting really sick of it. The Jordan Love to Romeo Dobbs touchdown pass was not a 50 50 ball. So can we please just stop with that? Unless I don't know what a 50 50 ball is, because my understanding of a 50 50 ball is that you know, both the DB and the receiver have an equal chance of coming down with it, basically a jump ball. And I've, you know, watched that pass 10 times now. And, you know, love, he gets the ball to teardrop down, nice touch pass. He puts it in between the receiver, Dobbs, and the DB. And in my mind, either Dobbs is catching that ball or it's getting dropped. Or maybe the DB knocked it away, but I don't. I don't see how there was any chance that DB was going to catch that ball. So I, I don't know. I feel like it was a nice pass. Yeah, maybe could have let him eight inches or something. But it was pretty freaking nice pass to get that ball to turn over um, from a short yardage throw like that. So I think it's kind of disparaging to call that a fifty-fifty ball. But maybe I don't know what a fifty-fifty ball is then. Um, I'm looking forward to Belichick. I think he's the kind of guy. Let me stop there. Um, I'll say this. I think if the DB had turned around, which, you know, I mean, and that's part of it, right? You you see the DB running away, you throw it past his head, whatever. But I think if the DB had realized where the ball was, he could have turned around and caught it. That's 100% possible. Um, I'm watching it right now in slow motion. If, if the DB wasn't playing Dobbs and had, you know, turned around to realize where the ball was, he could have jumped in front of it and, and caught the ball, but he, he didn't try. And this is why I said the ball was underthrown. Uh, Romeo Dobbs had to slow down and come almost to a stop and then kind of ran through the DB to jump up and get the ball. It's not necessarily a bad throw. I think that's going to be a touchdown almost every single time because the DB is not. I mean, you go up against some premier defensive backs, they may, you know, kind of sense things out a little bit better and realize what's going on and be able to stop and turn around and, and catch the ball. Most of the time, that's probably not going to happen. Um, but, you know, w- w- again, was it a beautiful, perfect pet? No, he, it was, it was, it, if it was thrown further, Romeo Dobbs doesn't have to slow down. I mean, he had a step on him. If he could have thrown it out in front of him, he could have thrown it where only Dobbs could have got it. And instead, you know, again, Dobbs had to kind of hit the brakes, turn around, jump up and sort of reach over the defender to grab the ball and wrestle it down. So, you know, and, and people, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you, you threw it past the defender's head, right? So, you know, he's looking away and you throw it past his head. You're like, right, but that's only because Dobbs slowed down. If, if, the, if Dobbs wasn't there and the DB just kept running in that direction as fast as he possibly could, it would have hit the DB in the back. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think some people are being too unfair as far as why it was a bad throw. I think this is a very high percentage because again, the DB is not going to turn around in that situation. He's, he's in panic mode. He's trying to run. And so as long as you see the back, if you can get it up high enough 
which he did, you know, Romeo jumped up and caught it. Just make sure that you throw it up to where, you know, the DB is, uh, it's not going to hit the DB. You just throw it up high enough for your guy to go get it. Then you should be okay. Um, but you know, was it a perfect teardrop pat? Not, not necessarily. So I don't know. I, I guess I fall a little bit more in between on that. Again, if the DB knew where it was and it turned it again, remove Romeo Dobbs from the equation and let that guy just run. And, and he's playing receiver. Could he, are we saying it's impossible for him to catch it? Of course not. That's insane. I mean, Romeo Dobbs was basically on the guy's shoulders. How could it be impossible for the DB to get it if Romeo Dobbs could get it? They're, they're, in, they're occupying the exact same space. So, you know, is it a 50-50 ball? Well, not if the DB, I guess, isn't looking for it. He's not, you know, but could it have been if the DB turned around and was actually jumping up and they were fighting for it together? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What, what, what do you call a 50-50 ball, I guess? If it's just where the DB had a at least 5% chance of getting it, then yes, it was a 50-50 ball. If it was actually two people trying to get it and the receiver got it, then no, it wasn't a 50-50 ball. I had a little delight in putting a young quarterback through his paces this week, so I'm anxious to kind of see how that goes, and, and hopefully he seems like the man for the job to throw some looks at love in practice that he hasn't seen, and so I think that'll be good for the quarterback. Uh, and then just wondering if you saw Jason Wildey's comments. Um, I don't have the quote no. right in front of me, but it was something to the effect of that Jordan Love needs to learn how to chew out his receivers. And man, It's amazing how some people can complain and piss and moan about Aaron Rodgers, and then when Rodgers leaves, we complain and piss and moan that Jordan Love isn't Aaron Rodgers. I don't understand. And that just rubbed me the wrong way. Like, really, dude? I, I, I don't know. I'm lost patience with him uh also loving and and yeah that i mean we're, we're getting so nitpicky why would i care how he responds why would i care i care about throw the freaking ball to the right guy at the right time accurately i don't care what you're doing outside of, or you need to yell at people what, what are you talking about do you have nothing to talk about in your radio show you got nothing else going on in your life like you need to kick a helmet Friggin' yell at the fans. Okay, dude. That love is getting guys to jump on the count for free plays. All right, bye. Yeah, that is happening. I wish he was capitalizing on those free plays a little bit more, but um, that is that is good that people are jumping, I guess, getting the at least the penalty yards out of it. Hey, Kyle again. Sorry, I think I got cut off there. I just wanted to say, if I didn't get it in, that it's been really cool to see Love be quite good, I think, in practice so far and in the games with getting that free play on the hard count. Uh, I mean, I think we know who he watched do that. I don't have to go over that, but that's a cool element to add in. Um, and now I totally forgot what I was just going to say. <laughs> you oh, did I say that. Tell you. Did you notice, I think just unofficially, I was counting the first team offense snaps and i had all but two of their plays utilize pre-snap motion i don't know if you if you caught that as well no i didn't but um but you know i think surprise you're the first one to call in about that that's been a major topic of discussion is uh is the increase in pre-snap motion so if it really was that much that's surprising nobody else has mentioned that you had said last year was it like 38 percent or something i realized no. the preseason but no it was it was way lower it was, um, I think in 2021, it was sub 20%. And then in 2022, it was up to like 20, 22, 23%, something like that. And then in both cases, 2021 and 2022, only one team was even above the 20s. Like 25% is like the second highest every year. And then I think two years ago, Miami was number one. And last year was the 49ers or vice versa or something where they're at like 40% or something just insane. But yeah, no nobody is up in the 30s like ever. So yeah, that would be pretty wild if if there was pre snap motion that much. And we'll see if there is a big jump this year. Yeah. Be something to keep an eye on um, against the Patriots for sure. I mean that that could be a matchup thing too against the Bengals. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, definitely need to watch that closer. You know, to go from 38 percent to 80 yeah. high 80s, <laughs> even in the preseason. Uh, seem to get that got my attention 
I mean, I don't know if that's something that they're going to be using more and more. Uh, I, I know they went to that jet suite maybe one, three times, but they were doing some interesting things there. Um, so I want to get your take on that. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think, again, I don't think 80% is a thing. That would be kind of like, remember that game? I think it was the Patriots ran like every play against the Bills and beat them in like that blizzard or something. That was an anomaly, right? <laughs> I mean, that uh, 80% is not going to be a thing. 50% would be the highest I've ever seen. So, yeah, but, but I, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe this is going to be a new kind of offense that just hasn't really been a thing. Uh, it's not to say nobody's done it. Maybe somebody in college is doing it or whatever. I, I only have a two-year sample size. But, yeah, I mean, 25% is high. That's that's a high number for pre-snap motion as far as what I know about it. Hey, Ryan. Uh, just wanted to share something that I had watched on YouTube uh, yesterday. All right. um, it was J.T. O'Sullivan's uh, YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel called Quarterback School. Yep. So, and I started watching him a little bit last year, not a whole lot, but he did have some things that helped explain and allow you to learn the system a little bit more as far as how the, the plays are called, kind of like how Clayton uses the terminology, which really helps you uh, begin to understand things on a different level. And uh, J.T. O'Sullivan broke down uh, every pass that uh, Jordan Love had for the preseason game, and he had a lot of good things to say about him. Um, and he pointed out some things, uh, especially on the throw to Musgraves that he overthrew. Um, on that throw, he was bouncing up and down, and his feet weren't quite pointing the right direction. So uh, there are simple things there in the mechanics, I believe, that are definitely fixable. And he definitely pointed out some of the passes he made was really, really uh, difficult going to a, rolling out to his left and making a throw was not easy, but he did it. Um, he gave him high points on that and the throw to Watson uh, being pinpoint and, and everything, the mechanics being where they need to be. But he did say there was things that he can improve on, uh, which is encouraging to see that those are things he can improve on. It's not stuff that he's hit a ceiling on. So I am encouraged by that. Um, it was very useful to hear what he had to say uh, coming from just a different point of view. Uh, so I encourage guys to go and watch them because I, I think the more that we're educated, uh, the smarter we are when it comes to explaining it to other people and just how we watch the game. We see it uh, on a whole new understanding. So um, I definitely encourage you guys to do that just so that we have uh, the best takes and the best comments that we can when we're educated. That I believe that uh, it just improves the overall quality of everything. So I uh, just wanted to give that a uh, you know, share the information with you, Ryan, and just his point of view on that. And uh, I am encouraged by what I saw. Um, I'm hopeful for to see much more in the next game against the Patriots and that he cleans up some of those mistakes. And especially some of the – I guess the one thing I wanted to point out was on the pass that he decided to throw to the outside left flat, Jaden Reed was wide open in the middle. And if he had chose to throw to him – Jaden Reed had a free run for at least 20-something yards. So looking at these, you know, play breakdowns, there are guys that are wide open yeah. that he has options to throw to. I think he's going to have plenty of time and options if he can just keep his throws accurate and mm -hmm. stay consistent because these guys are getting open legitimately. So I am hurt. Yeah, um, Gary got cut off again there, but. That's one of the things I had mentioned actually recently was I've never seen or don't recall seeing a Packers team with this many people wide open. And it, I, I can't give credit to the receivers necessarily. I mean, this is a schematic thing. It, like it, with, with Musgrave being open, it, wa it wasn't because he's fast. Nobody was chasing him. It was a zone thing. Not that it doesn't help it to some to some degree, but... You know, this is what I've been saying. Like, why, you know, you see Travis Kelsey running wide open. Why aren't our guys wide open like that? It's not to say Travis Kelsey isn't good, but I mean, he's just running in the vacated zone that's been created by the offensive play callers play call. And we never see, and all I've seen from the Packers recently is guys just running wide open. So we're finally seeing that. I don't know what exactly has clicked. I don't know if this will carry on into the regular season. I'm just saying I've been complaining about it for a long time that I see lots of other teams do it to us, and I don't ever see our team do it to other people. You know, occasionally someone's open, but usually not. I mean, someone's coming across, 
and and maybe it just you know guys were playing man uh, against because we had guys like Cobb and Lazard. You know what I mean? And it's easy to just lock them up. And so yeah, when Rodgers is throwing these passes, you know it's got to be just right out in front. It's got to be a perfect pass, and they got to catch it, and then they go down right away because you know that's just it's tight man coverage because these guys are no good at. It. I'm not saying they always played man coverage against us, but you get what I'm saying. Maybe just by virtue of having better, faster players, it's causing defenses to have to adjust certain things, and which and that's creating opportunities. Whatever, I don't, I don't really know, but it has been really, really good to see that. As far as JT O'Sullivan's thing, I did see that. I think personally, I took that as a little bit discouraging more than encouraging, um, only because one of the the narratives, and I know this is kind of what you're saying in terms of being more intelligent as opposed to just having sort of random theories, but. Um, you know, one of the random theories out there is that Jordan has essentially been perfect aside from, you know, just just a, a little bit like th- that pass. It was because it was basically a no look or, or you know, everything's fine in terms of the process and, and, and all that stuff. And then you start hearing from JT O'Sullivan like his foot works off like, bro, I thought we fixed that like two years ago. <laughs> what are you talking about? Now, granted, JT O'Sullivan doesn't know what the Packers are teaching him. Right. I mean, granted, there are certain fundamental things that generally you're going to want to do, but every team does have differences in terms of how they ask you to do things. Um, I think Aaron Rodgers had sort of changed things up a couple different times. And, you know, Jordan Love is kind of doing more of the, you know, Aaron Rodgers type thing. That's who his quarterback coach is, is, is that guy. And Matt LaFleur has his preferences as well. So, so they're kind of specific. Um, so how much of it is, things that you would never do as a quarterback. Like, obviously, you know, when you talk about your feet are facing this way and you're throwing that way, that's obviously no, – nobody's coaching you to have your feet facing the wrong direction. But, um, you know, in terms of, like, how wide is – you know, he, he talked about he tends to have a wider base than than what you see with other quarterbacks. Maybe that's a negative. Maybe that's coached or taught. I don't know. I don't know. But um, I don't know. I guess I found that discouraging just because – a lot of the things you look at and say, okay, you can clean that up. You can, you, 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 this is brand new to you working with Christian Watson, working with Luke Musgrave, you know, doing these kinds of things is new. Fundamentals like footwork is not new. This is the, you have been working on this for years. So, you know, you can say these are things that can be improved. Yes. But these are also things that if they were going to be improved, probably would have been by now. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm just saying. So, yeah, I, I, I guess that one kind of bummed me out a little bit. And and nobody's perfect, right? Everybody's got these little quirks that they kind of do and, and they work through it. You look at Philip Rivers' throwing motion and, you know, I mean, even, even Justin Fields, people are saying he's going to win MVP and he's still got the same issues. And his are much more serious as far as like the processing speed and all that kind of stuff. Um, those are Those are much more damning than like your feet were kind of lined up wrong, you know, once in a while or whatever. So... I don't know. We'll see. Uh, the, the other thing that's kind of upsetting is, you know, again, there, there was the, well, his eyes were looking off the linebacker excuse on the Musgrave thing. It's like, well, that's great for that one play, but why does it keep happening every single time he throws, you know, in every single training camp that we have? And then you start to hear JT O'Sullivan like, yeah, his footwork is kind of, it's kind of crap. And it's like, oh, well, that sucks because maybe that's why these things are happening. Because what that means is maybe that's why that's going to keep happening. We don't know. But again, that that's why when I heard him say that, it was a little bit more discouraging than uh, anything else for me personally. What's going on, Ryan? It is Carson from Cleveland, What's Ohio. Up, dude, and I, was, I was watching this podcast. It was why you can't write off the Green Bay Packers. It was like a Fox Sports podcast. All right. Um, and I was thinking about like Jared Goff and the Lions winning the division. And I was thinking about how like a lot of people think like, oh, Jared Goff is some like elite top ten quarterback because of the second half of the year he had last year. But before Jared Goff went to the Lions and had, like, that good end of last season, he had a really bad beginning of last season. And then when he was on the Rams, he wasn't particularly very good. And so, like, what if going into next season, Jared Goff kind of returns to that earlier of last season Rams type of Jared Goff where he's not really that elite quarterback? And sure, like, maybe that version of Jared Goff is still, like, top 15, top 20, but – it wouldn't be that elite quarterback that everyone's kind of expecting him to be. And I think that's like a realistic thing that could happen. And so um, they, they, the Lions wide receiver is suspended for the first half of the year. Let's say Jared Goff kind of declines a little bit back to where he was before. Are the Lions really that good of a team? Because 
Jared Goff was a big reason that their offense kind of skyrocketed at the end of last year. And if Jared Goff kind of returns to that position that he was at, then their offense isn't nearly as good as it was last season. And then also their defense, even though they added a little bit, still isn't really anything special. And so I feel like if Jared Goff regresses, it's really going to be a two-way race for the division between the Packers and the Vikings because the Lions are just going to fall back off. So I don't know. Maybe that's just me thinking that because I want the Packers to do good. But I feel like that is kind of a realistic way of thinking. But um, let me know what you think about that. See ya. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit in the middle. You're, you're right about how things were last year. And, and it really, his it almost lines up perfectly with their record and his quarterback play. I mean, the weeks don't exactly line up, but um, in a way, they, they almost kind of do. So he was pretty god-awful through week 11. His PFF grades were 49, 60, 40, 60, 60, 70, 50, 50, 80, 40, 50, 40. That's, that's trash. That's two good games through 11 weeks. Their record um, through the first eight weeks was one and six, right? And it wasn't always the offense. The offense did do some pretty positive things. But even, even beyond that, I mean, it was um, through week 12, they were four and seven. And then they went on to win, what, five of their next six games, they won three, six, eight of uh, ten, eight, eight of ten. But he also, if, if you look at beyond that, 70, 80, 50, 70, 80, 80, he, he was one of the better quarterbacks down the stretch. Again, the weeks as far as the record don't exactly line up, but to some degree they do. And, and part of the reason people are high on the Lions is, dude, they won eight of ten last year. They were one of the hottest teams in football. If they didn't have such a slow start, they would have coasted into the playoffs. They could have da 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 and you're right. I think maybe that's a little overblown. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it wasn't entirely golf led, but um, to the degree that it was, I do think that there should be a little bit of expected regression, just in general, considering how how solid they played. But I also don't really expect him to be much worse overall, because I think how he started was worse than what you typically get from Jared Goff. And my evidence for that is he had a 72 overall PFF grade, which is pretty much what he is every single year. In 2020, it was a 72. In 2019, it was a 72. In 2017, it was a 73. He's got a couple outliers. His first year in, in Detroit was bad. In 2018, he was really, really good. And obviously, as a rookie, he was trash. But every other year has been almost exactly 72, which means his bad start and his really hot finish kind of balance out. So he'll be probably be better than he was when he started the season last year and worse than he was when he ended the season last year. Now, if he is able to continue that success down the stretch, then we're all just basically screwed um, depending on their defense because their defense is one of the worst in football. So, <laughs> I mean, if they, if they stay that way, then, then, you know, we're obviously in, in uh, decent shape, but I mean, if they can continue being a top five offense and then even have a, top 20 defense that's a pretty scary football team but obviously we have no way no way of knowing that we'll have to see um kind of how things shake out because you know you could say well yeah Jamison suspended he didn't even play last year because of an injury so they're going to get more Jamison Williams this year than they had last year so I don't know I don't really know what to make of the Detroit Lions I I, I don't understand why they were as good of a football team as they were I hope it was their running backs that they got rid of. That would be great news because I don't know why they got rid of those two guys. I thought they were doing a great job for them, but they did. Um, but yeah, they got like a mediocre quarterback, one good wide receiver, and a good but not like the best offensive line we've seen in the entire NFL offensive line. I do think it's slightly overhyped how good it is. Very good, but it's not like, again, the greatest thing in human history. I think arguably the Packers and maybe even the Vikings have a better offensive line depending on um, – the Met, which would put them third in their own division. But um, again, that's debatable. But still, I, I don't know where the success comes from, which makes it so hard for me to figure out where they're going to go. Because it seemed like that whole thing shouldn't have happened. I don't know why they were so good. They don't have an elite tight end. They don't have an elite quarterback. They have one elite player that is... that is. I mean, even the running backs are not even... You know, Jam Jamal Williams had a bunch of touchdowns. That's true, but... They don't have like that truly elite, like Adrian Peterson type of running back. So I don't know. I don't know what made them so good. And um, it definitely makes me somewhat nervous for the future, but it also is somewhat encouraging because 
you have to assume that's going to get tamped down. They, they just don't have a roster that is built to be top five, in my opinion. I don't know what caused it. Hopefully the NFL figured it out and can adjust to it because um, because it's the freaking Lions, and I don't ever want them to be successful in anything. That's why. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. We're rated about an hour. Oh, look at that. Just crossed over a new an hour. So you guys have a good rest of your day. Tomorrow we're starting off with three calls from Jersey Mike, so I figured this would be a good spot to stop instead of ripping through all those or cutting him off halfway. But, again, um, if you want to check out the daily podcast, you can see that right here. Uh, if you want to call in, please do so. 608-501-0718. Just call in, leave a message. I'm not going to pick up and be like, I'm eating dinner, dude. What do you want? Just drop a message and talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. And um, we'll go from there. And again, we'll we'll keep working toward, I feel like we're really getting into a pretty solid rhythm here. We'll, we'll keep working toward uh, doing this live. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know. I probably should have done it today. I just, I just chickened out and didn't do it. So. <laughs> Uh, anyways, you guys have a good rest of your night. I will talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.